dedicated to the glory of God and His service, what is being done here. Now, the reason, and thank you for indulging me, that little uh, blast from the past, why, why even bring it up? Well, you had to have, ask the question, why even do it? You know, what, why go to the effort to build this facility, put in the daycare, when we could have just built bigger at the Tyler campus? You know, we could have become a, a mega church right there on the Tyler and had really cool, big facilities, but instead... We prayed, and we discerned, and we asked God what He desired, what would be best. And what He revealed and, and led us is that we've been given so much, and the best way to pass it on to other people, at least for us and for at that time, was to start another facility, another worship place. And the statistics really bear it out that a new church plant is more attractive to new people than just building bigger what you have. And so as we went about then considering what and how, we wanted to create a place then that would welcome families of West Wichita into his forever family. The reason that we targeted families is that that's who lives out here. And we specifically chose daycare to serve those families so that there might be an opportunity to share Jesus not only with the young people but also their families and that there might be then that draw to come and join us in worship. We're not just asking and we're not just going about expanding our family of ascension but it really is for the greater family of God which is a family of faith. Now, this family of faith is based upon, then, beliefs. And I want to spend some time preaching tonight on faith and belief. You notice that when Jesus asked his own, well, who do people say that I am? What, what do people believe about me? And it was just all over the map, right? Well, some think you're a resurrected John the Baptist, you know, or maybe you're, you're this prophet we've been waiting for, Elijah, or, or some other big prophet. We don't, they don't know. And Jesus, I'm sure, is going, yeah, that's kind of the buzz out there, but what do you believe? What do you who have been following me say? And you heard Peter stand up for everyone and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in that there is our confession of faith that we hope that all who come through these doors, from our open arms families to the community members, that they too will join us in that confession. But I have a little something to say about beliefs that maybe you didn't realize, but you just kind of knew intuitively, that you believe a lot of things, and it just, it changes. Like, you're driving home, you told your spouse, I will be home on time, and you really believed it, right? You know, you got on the cell phone, I'll be home on time, but it didn't happen, right? Okay, all right, so you're, what you believed to be true didn't happen, and so you had to change your beliefs with reality, okay? Some of you out there think that you're a pretty good grandma, right? You know, I mean, there's good grandmas out there, but you think, I'm a really good grandma. And, and you know who tells you so? These big loving arms that just come and give you a big gug and a smooch. You're the best grandma ever. And you know, you start to believe that, right? Okay. And you have no reason to doubt it until you realize after the kids have been there a little too long and your patience is a little bit short, you're not feeling like the best grandma in the world, and uh, your belief has to be replaced then by reality, and uh, maybe you're not the best. You know, and, and some of us, why we think we're, we believe that we're good cooks, you know, and, and then you make the, the meal, and, and it, it's a flopper, you know, and no one wants to eat it. Yeah. Well, now... When you really start looking at your beliefs, you realize, well, throughout the day, you have 
perhaps hundreds and hundreds of different beliefs. In fact, you might even realize you believe uh, and think you believe things that you don't actually believe. And that's kind of why I'm bringing this up. And that we say we believe a lot of things until we bump into reality. See, reality is what you bump into when you're wrong. And there it is. So we find about beliefs that you really can only have one belief about a particular topic or thing, and that's it. And then when new information or data comes along, you have to then get a new belief. So if you thought you were a really good cook and you cooked up a flopper, then in that moment, as everyone's kind of pushing it away and you're yourself going, okay, we can't eat this, we're, we're getting pizza, all right, you, you then have to replace that you're not the best cook. You believed you were, but now you're not. And you realize how beliefs kind of go from moment to moment. And, and what you really believe then, um, well, wait a minute, I, I, I am a good cook, though. And you just then give it enough time, and guess what starts creeping back into your mind? I believe I am a good cook. Because you cook another meal, and guess what? It wasn't a flopper. It was good. It, it was more than good. It was the best. All right, so now you can hold that belief again. Well, this is really important information to know that you can only have one belief at a time because what we believe about God, well, and what I believe what He's doing in my life and, and that not so much that I just believe that He exists, but that, that I believe that He's good, that I believe He's got my back, that I believe He's merciful and that he, He's going to forgive forgive me and welcome me someday into this forever home of his, those beliefs, too, go from moment to moment, and they bump into so-called realities that you have. And so we find then that if I can only have one belief at one given moment, then how do I deal when I bump into those realities? The first thing you do, you realize, well, there's just layers of belief, layers upon layers. And the first thing you, you realize is that, well, um, it's going to be okay. You know, you, you're not going to be home in time. You believed you were, but it's going to be okay, right? I mean, so you're five minutes late. We, we're just... And that's kind of how you go from moment to moment, and you realize it's going to be okay. But sometimes... It's not going to be okay. And then what do you do? No problem. There's a belief under that. And the next layer is, well, things are going to get better. You realize that right now, finances in our house aren't so good. And, or, or right now, our family relationships are kind of at odds with each other. Or, or right now, our congregation isn't quite where we'd like it to be or whatever. And then you realize, but it's going to get better better. And guess what happens a little bit? It does get better. You know, they, they studied married couples who were really at odds with each other. I mean, they were ready to divorce. And, and they studied those couples who were almost ready to divorce each other, who didn't, who then stayed together, and then they checked back in with him five years later. And they found that the majority of those couples who were ready to get a divorce in five years who stuck with it had a marriage relationship and happiness that was very good. Nothing like it was five years ago. And so when you have enough of these kind of experiences, you realize, well, wait a minute. Things get better. But sometimes they don't. No problem. There's a layer under that as well, and it's called distraction. I know, you're thinking, really? Yeah. You just believe that I, I will set my mind on other things, and then I won't care so much that life's really hard. And so we distract ourselves with hobbies and fun things, or you just start working a lot longer. Whatever it takes, you distract. Until that catches up with you, but no problem, we got another one, and then we decide I'm going to need to medicate myself. Now, I'm not, I'm not disparaging this. Sometimes you need to go to the doctor 
and they need to give you a medication. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about self-medication. Like you went, to, uh, you went to the store and you just spent more money than you had because it felt good. It did more than distraction. It, there was something inside of you that just, ah. Of course, then you get all kinds of other distractions that are much easier with alcohol and, and the opioid addiction is a, a, you know, that's what we're talking about. That's where this comes from is people trying to distract themselves. Now, when you finally hit bottom on all the distractions, guess what you do then? If they're, if they're people like us, you get religion, all right? That's when you show back up to church. That's when you start praying real hard again. You start, you find your Bible, you dust off the, and you start making promises to God. God, if you just do this, then I'm going to do that. And you do get religion. And then, <sighs> now the thing about all of these layers is that you really don't go from one to the next. You, you just go from moment to moment and you decide which is going to be best. The seriousness of what you believe and the, the, what you have available to you and, and then, you know, God's always with you and you just kind of switch in and out all of these things. And that's how most people get through life. And I'm talking about the people I'm looking at and the people you're looking at. How we get through life with our beliefs that I'm going to be okay and that God really has my back and that, and that I believe that this is all making sense. And, but what's finally at the very bottom of all of this kind of layers is a belief that life is really up to me. You know, if it's, if it's going to get fixed, if it's going to get better, if I'm going to get through life, it really is up to me. And you will find that almost every person without exception at the very bottom of their beliefs about life, that's there. Because at the very bottom is ourselves. If it's going to happen, it's going to be me. Now you can add religion to that. You can add distractions. You can add working hard. But at, and the reason that you can know, you can test yourself to see, is this really true? You can test yourself by seeing just how upset and angry and worried you are when you are not enough to get through life, when your distractions aren't getting it done, when your medications aren't getting it done. When you look at your life and see just how really desperate and awful it has become and you have no way out. You can see that what I really believe is that life is up to me. Now, you are people who, you've got religion. You know, you, you've got God. You, you know that somehow that just doesn't sound right. You know, I, I should know that life really isn't up to me. It's, it's really God. But I also know I can only have one belief at a time. And when I have this belief that it's up to me, guess who can't be the one taking care of you and the one looking out for you and the one providing for you? Well, we know that's not right. But here's the, the, the thing is, we just immediately jump into the fix, that somehow the fix is to feel bad about all this. All these things that I've been doing, oh my goodness, and I should have just been trusting the Lord. I should have just been giving it to God, and I haven't been doing that, and I just feel ashamed and awful, and God, I'm so sorry. That's not the fix. You'll never, you'll never find the peace and the joy and the life of faith with just shame and guilt. The second we just immediately jump into, then, well, then I just, I need to do something. I, I will willpower myself. But the fix of belief and faith, where it comes from, how it's nurtured, how it's developed, comes from an intimate, personal knowledge over time. Belief comes from intimate, personal knowledge over time. And the reason then you trust yourself, who do you spend the most time with? 
You know how you feel. You know what you want. You know what drives you crazy. You know your desperations. You are intimately aware of yourself. And you know how you've gotten through life to this point. There's no, there's no shocker here of why you trust yourself and why you believe that you're the final answer. And if the answer then isn't that I should just feel bad or, or repent of all of this, well, what is it? As Jesus asked his disciples, what do you believe about me? And Peter stood up and said, well, you're the Christ. Jesus didn't commend Peter for making a good observation. He didn't commend Peter for, for finally deciding that he was Jesus and his Savior, right? Who did he point to as the one who had given him this faith? The Father has revealed this to you. Now life goes from moment to moment to moment. Peter truly had this belief, but put him in a different moment when Jesus is being bound and beaten and they're looking for his followers. Hey, you're one of him, right? No. Who did Peter believe was going to take care of him in that moment? Himself. When Jesus then rises from the dead and first thing he wants everyone to know is that, of course, he's risen, but go, go tell the disciples and tell Peter. And when Peter has this intimate, personal knowledge of Jesus, when he finally hears Jesus very graciously and tenderly love on him, forgive him, see, this intimate personal knowledge isn't just in information. It's in a person. And it is Jesus who comes to give this kind of faith in our moment-to-moment-to-moment -to -moment -to -moment life. You can only have one belief at a time. And if Jesus truly is, then that belief, not that you believe He exists, but that He's got your back, that He is your Savior, that He is the one who is merciful to you, that He is with you, that no matter what happens to you here, nothing can take you from Him, then you can't have another belief. It, that's, that is your belief. You can only have one. And how then does this kind of faith is born in you? It is born through the resurrected Jesus. See, as He suffers on the cross, He suffers for all of our doubt for all of our rejection from God. See, our problem isn't social, that somehow we just need life to work out better at work. Our, our problem isn't psychological, as if, you know, we're just not thinking right. We're not, we're not emotionally right. Our problem is theological, and that we truly have rejected God, and we truly do want ourselves to be in charge. Even as miserable as it is and as weak as we are, that's what we want. And Jesus, he takes this rejection into himself at the cross and he is forsaken. And as he rises from the dead, he can give to us what we do not have, a completely new life of faith. You see, at the very bottom, faith is a gift which Jesus gives to us and holds us fast in it. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. As we go through moment by moment, and as we see that I don't believe, it is then to turn and to cry out to Jesus with empty hands, and He fills them with renewed faith. Will He do that? Yes. He did it for Peter. He did it for his disciples. He's been doing it ever since. He will do it for you, and he does it for me. The reason we built this place is so that Jesus will continue to give that gift of faith to small children and their parents, to the community members here. That's why we're here. The gift of faith in Jesus. Amen.